Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. President Biden reacts to the trespassing of the Chinese spy balloon, and the House also votes on a resolution regarding the craft. Alleged abuses by the FBI and accusations of big tech colluding with government officials. House Republicans kick off hearings on the weaponization of the federal government. Lawmakers from both parties scold Southwest Airlines for the December meltdown, calling it an epic disaster. Find out what Southwest is now saying. Troubles at the southern border, but with a new twist. High numbers of Chinese and Russians entering illegally from Mexico in numbers never seen before. President Biden is speaking on the Chinese spy balloon, saying it wasn't a major breach. Meanwhile, the House voted unanimously on a resolution regarding the balloon. President Biden on Thursday said he had no regrets that the Chinese spy balloon wasn't shot down sooner. I said I wanted it shot down as soon as possible. And they were worried about the damage that could be done even in a big state like Montana. This thing was gigantic. What happened if it came down and hit a school in the rural area? What happened if it came down? So I told them as soon as they can shoot it down, shoot it down. Biden also said the balloon didn't gather much information compared to other methods of espionage countries around the world use. The total amount of uh, intelligence gathering that's going on by every country around the world is overwhelming. And the idea that a balloon could traverse, uh, break American airspace is, uh, anyway, it's, it's not a major breach. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said China had also targeted 40 other nations with such spy balloons. Meanwhile, the House on Thursday voted unanimously to condemn the invasion of the Chinese spy balloon into U.S. airspace. Lawmakers called it a brazen violation of United States sovereignty. This was a blatant violation of American sovereignty as part of a comprehensive surveillance program on the United States as well as other countries across the globe. This was a test by the Chinese Communist Party And it saddens me to say that I think that this administration failed that test. The House voted 419 to 0 on the resolution. It's intended to convey that Republicans and Democrats are united in condemning the spy balloon. So there's been complete transparency by the Biden administration. I conclude by saying, though, there's one thing that we all agree upon, that the United States sovereignty was crossed by the PRC. The resolution also says that the U.S. should act quickly to prevent foreign espionage material from violating U.S. airspace. A test by Beijing in 2018 may hint at more capabilities of the Chinese spy balloon. Back then, a similar aircraft could carry three hypersonic missiles. With reports of balloons serving roles in Beijing's warfare, let's take a closer look at a previous test done by China in 2018. Footage displays a similar high-altitude balloon, but with three hypersonic missiles dropped as part of testing. Chinese state broadcaster CCTV reported on the weapons test in 2018, showing the balloon lifting three hypersonic glide vehicles, or HGVs, from the ground. HGVs are generally launched by rockets. Once in orbit, they can fly through the atmosphere themselves. According to Chinese media reports, the balloon-dropped HGVs were part of an effort to test the weapon's free-fall process and develop precision hypersonic warheads. The U.S. launches an intercontinental ballistic missile from California into the Pacific. U.S. officials say the missile test was planned months earlier and is not a response to recent events. But it comes in the wake of the Chinese spy balloon and after North Korea paraded 12 long-range missile launchers. The U.S. Air Force launched the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile from Vandenberg Space Force Base at about 11 p.m. Pacific time yesterday. The missile traveled about 4,200 miles and reached one of the islands within the Marshall Islands. An announcement calls it a routine activity to demonstrate the effectiveness of the United States' nuclear deterrent. A commander involved says the test shows the reliability of the systems while sending a message of assurance to allies. Republicans are beginning to look into the alleged weaponization of the federal government. The House Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government held its first hearing on Thursday. Entity's Daniel Monahan has the story. Thomas Paine said, he that would make his own liberty secure 
must guard even his enemy from opposition. The hearing is the first after Republicans unveiled a thousand-page whistleblower report in December. Congressman Jim Jordan detailed charges leveled against the FBI by whistleblowers. November 18th, 2021, an FBI whistleblower discloses to Republicans on the House Judiciary that the FBI created a threat tag for parents voicing their concerns at school board meetings. In a 2021 letter to President Biden, the National School Boards Association characterized disruptions at school board meetings across the nation as a form of domestic terrorism and hate crime. Jordan also mentioned FBI agents being run out of the bureau for attending conservative political events. In my time in Congress, I have never seen anything like this. Dozens and dozens of whistleblowers, FBI agents coming to us. Former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard emphasized that the work before them is too important to fall victim to partisan politics. We cannot be so short-sighted as to thinking silencing speech that we don't like today will not result in our own voices being silenced tomorrow. Gabbard added that many Americans are now afraid to speak freely, scared that they might lose their jobs, get canceled, or even be charged with a crime. She said people's fears are not unfounded. They tell us we must blindly trust them or face the consequences, even though our government has a long history of lying to us. Meanwhile, Congressman Matt Gates questioned Rabin Group lobbyist Elliot Williams, who previously served in the Obama administration. Mr. Williams, wouldn't the American people feel like this government wasn't so weaponized against them if there wasn't such a revolving door between Department of Justice senior officials and lobbying? Gates pointed out that the lobbying company Williams works at, Rabin Group, represents Pfizer and Google. Quite Does Google fun. engage with the FBI, Mr. Williams? I don't work for either Google or the FBI, well, sir, I, so Gosh, I I'd, I'd have to again point you to your own client list that you advertise on your own website, which includes Google. Does it surprise you that at the Raven Group's website, Pfizer and Google are clients? Meanwhile, Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin criticized the hearing as a forum for conspiracy theories. Instead, he cited the now defunct January 6th committee as a model of bipartisanship. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. New developments in the House subcommittee's efforts to expose alleged politicization in the FBI and some crossfire between the Justice Department and the House committee overseeing the agency. Let's get some analysis. Joining me now is Mark Ruskin. Mark spent 20 years as an FBI special agent, primarily undercover, and is the author of The Pretender, My Life Undercover for the FBI. He was also a former assistant district attorney in Brooklyn. Thank you for your time, Mark. Hello, Kevin. Good to see you again. Yes. Former FBI special agent Nicole Parker testified before the House Subcommittee on Weaponization. She was emotional. She told lawmakers she resigned from the Bureau after it became, quote, politically weaponized. Now, you've been warning about this for years. So does this surprise you that this would happen? Well, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that agents are coming forward and, and speaking now. Agents have, especially field agents, have historically been objective and very neutral in their investigations and not political at all. So it's very upsetting for agents, both retired and on board, to see this happening. And I want to talk about the agents themselves. She said that there's two FBI's, the headquarters in Washington, where weaponization trickled down from, and the field offices, where the standard rank just do want to do their job to serve the country, protect American citizens, and fight crime. What challenges do agents face being objective in their duties in this alleged political atmosphere? Well, and this is something I address in my book. There are essentially two cultures in the FBI. There's the field agent culture, which is all the agents and all the field officers are in the street conducting investigations day to day and risking their lives to do so. And there's the management culture. And the management culture essentially are those who have given up the field and exchanged it for a desk. And there's historically been a lack of understanding and uh, confrontation between the two cultures. Now the management culture essentially has been politicized and the field culture is frustrated. Yes, the difference between the field and the management here. The House Judiciary Committee subpoenaed A.G. Garland and FBI Director Ray, and now the DOJ is firing back at the Chairman Congressman Jim Jordan. They're calling the subpoena, which requests documents relating to their using counterterrorism resources to go after parents participating in school board meetings, premature. The DOJ says they have offered to work with the committee. In your view, was the committee handling this fairly? The committee is handling this fairly. It's open. These are open hearings, unlike the hearings which were conducted a few years ago behind closed doors uh, when the other side was in, was in control. 
And not only is it uh, open hearings, but the, the concept of premature, it depends, you know, whose ox is being gored. I mean, from the point of view of the those conducting the hearings, they're not premature. Premature is not a legal term. It's just the opinion of those who perhaps aren't really fully willing to cooperate and are looking for a public relations type of angle to avoid cooperating with the subpoenas. Yeah, so thanks for sharing your insight on that. And then, of course, they have their right to the opinion. I want to talk about the actual subcommittee here. Do you think that testimony like this would ever get out to the public if it hadn't been made? And what do you think it could lead to? Well, I think that the, the, the these acts, uh, you know, by the FBI, the way it's been politicized, I would suggest, over the last uh, decade or so, would, would not be known to the public had there not been public hearings now and testimony and encouragement of FBI agents, both retired and, and on board, to come forward and, and, and testify and tell as whistleblowers what they know about what's going on and about the politicization of the Bureau. Uh, and so I, I don't think it, it, would have, it would have become known. And I think what it can lead to in the best of all possible worlds is to a restructuring of the FBI to make it into an objective and independent agency as it used to be that defends our democracy. Yes, and we will see if it leads to any reforms. Former FBI Special Agent Mark Ruskin, thank you so much for your analysis. Sure, my pleasure. Good to see you again, Kevin. Turning to a Senate hearing yesterday where both sides of the aisle criticized Southwest Airlines, one lawmaker called the airline's December meltdown an unmitigated disaster after more than 16,000 flights were canceled at the height of the holiday season. Republican Senator Ted Cruz, who represents Texas, where Southwest is based, said it was an epic screw-up. Many people, understandably, were deeply frustrated at not being able to get where they wanted to go, not being able to be with their family. And I've had multiple conversations with senior leadership at Southwest. I'm confident they understand it was an epic screw up. The airline blamed much of the trouble on the bad weather, but acknowledged it made mistakes and that technology issues were a factor. Southwest Chief Operating Officer Andrew Waterson. Let me be clear, we messed up. And I would like to explain to you how we messed up. In hindsight, we did not have enough winter operations resiliency. From where and how we de-ice aircraft to the cold resiliency of, of our ground support and equipment and infrastructure. Our high rates of cancellation in Denver and Chicago, where 25% of our flight crews are based, cause our crews to be displaced. Waterson said the carrier is introducing an updated crew scheduling system on Friday to address a specific failure during the debacle. At the hearing, senators recounted to Southwest a litany of horrendous travel stories people missing funerals and holiday gatherings, passengers forced to drive for 17 or more hours across the country after flights were cancelled, and cancer patients who could not get treatment. Two million Southwest passengers suffered consequences, separated from family and friends, not to mention their luggage, and hundreds of thousands of people stranded at airports across the country. We know that many of them had no clear instructions about what to do next. Pilots at Southwest told lawmakers on Thursday the debacle was all but inevitable. Casey Murray is the president of the Southwest Airline Pilots Association. What our pilots saw and have known for years is that Southwest struggles to manage nearly any disruption, regardless of the cause. Our recent history and the data shows a pattern of increasingly disruptive operational failures, misprioritization of resources, and worst of all, a hollow leveraging of our cult culture to cover up poor management decisions. The airline has already paid hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation and reimbursements to affected passengers and will cut 2022 bonuses to executives when they are awarded in March. The House is taking action on a D.C. law that would let non-citizens vote. They passed a joint resolution yesterday to block the law it would have allowed illegal immigrants and even foreign employees at embassies that are openly hostile to the U.S. to take part in local elections. The resolution was introduced by Representative James Comer. Here's what he had to say before the vote. Our nation's capital city plays host to hundreds of foreign organizations and embassies. Many of these foreign nationals have interests directly opposed to those of the United States. They make no claim otherwise. 
For years, my Democrat colleagues have decried potential foreign influence in our electoral process. But DC's new law potentially allows foreign agents from China, Russia, and other adversaries to participate in local elections held within this nation's capital city. Local officials urged members of Congress not to become involved in city matters, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said it was Congress's responsibility to intervene. He said the act from the D.C. Council would dilute the vote of American citizens and endanger city residents and businesses. Over 40 Democrats voted with Republicans to block it. It's the first time in eight years that the chamber has voted to cancel local measures. Senator Tom Cotton plans to introduce a version of the resolution in the Senate. If it passes, President Biden would then need to sign off on it to prevent the D.C. law from taking effect. The House also passed a resolution yesterday to overturn a D.C. law that would rewrite the city's criminal code. It would reduce criminal penalties. Over 30 House Democrats voted in support of overturning it. And speaking of non-citizens, immigration experts have some troubling findings. They say unprecedented numbers of people from nations hostile to the U.S., like China and Russia, are entering illegally from Mexico. Border Patrol data shows border officials encountered nearly 2,000 Chinese citizens on the Mexican border from October to December. That compares with about 4,400 for all the three prior years. The same data shows over 17,000 encounters with Russian individuals during the same three months. Russia and China have grown increasingly close in recent years. They cooperate in military drills, in opposing the United States, and on economic matters. Officials on the border say they don't have the support to do background checks on illegal immigrants, including ones from China and Russia, before releasing them into the U.S. And still to come, House members blame the Secretary of Defense for military retention problems. They say he shouldn't have made troops who left over the COVID vaccine repay their signing bonuses. And 200 potential flights are grounded daily due to a pilot shortage, and that's just Southwest. Several major airlines are now starting their own training programs. More in just a moment here on NTD News Today. The South Dakota Senate approves a bill that would ban hormone treatments, puberty blockers, and transgender surgeries for youth. Healthcare professionals who violate the law would lose their licenses and could be sued. The measure now goes to the desk of the governor. Minors born or diagnosed with a disorder of sexual development are exempt from the bill, as well as those who require treatment for infections, injuries, or diseases. Two amendments were rejected. One would have allowed minors to access puberty blockers for counseling. The other would have required mental health counseling for minors with gender dysphoria. Over 20 states have introduced legislation to restrict or ban cross-sex drugs and procedures for minors. Some bans are currently blocked by courts while lawsuits proceed. Some states are also pushing back against gun measures. A coalition of 24 states filed a lawsuit against the Biden administration over a recent rule. The new rule classifies pistols equipped with stabilizing braces as short-barreled rifles and so subjects them to federal regulation. Gun owners who use the braces would have to apply for a permit, register in a federal database, provide fingerprints to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, pay a tax, and face restrictions on the future transfer of the brace. The lawsuit says this requires millions of Americans to choose between their lawful firearms and their privacy. Stabilizing braces were originally decided, designed to help people with disabilities use pistols. They, were now, it, they're, they are now widely used, including by senior citizens and those with limited mobility, to prevent recoil and improve accuracy. The West Virginia Attorney General calls the Biden rule an effort to undermine Americans' Second Amendment rights. Supporters of the rule say the braces make pistols similar to rifles, so they should be under the same regulations. Lawmakers question the Secretary of Defense in a letter. Their concern is troops who had to pay back their signing bonuses when they were fired for not receiving a COVID vaccine. 
They wrote that the issue is one of the causes of the military's current recruitment and retention issues, and that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin bears the blame. Congressional Republicans are demanding an explanation from the Pentagon for policies they say amount to mistreatment of service members. They say the situation endangers national security. In a similar move, the House Armed Services Committee chairman and the House Subcommittee on Military Personnel chairman sent a separate letter to the Secretary of Defense. They wrote that they are hoping for more clarity now that the military's COVID vaccine mandate has ended. The letter contained a series of questions, along with the assertion that the Pentagon hasn't given adequate responses. A pilot shortage in the U.S. is limiting the number of flights that airlines can offer. Several major airlines are now partnering with flight schools or starting their own training programs. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details on the new strategy. Ashley Montana's first time flying was just last summer. Now she's preparing to land a small plane with three passengers. She sticks the landing to finish the training flight at a United Airlines school in the Arizona desert. On the ground, Montano is happy with her progress. With United and their push to uh, bring in more women and people of color it, and diversify uh, the flight deck, it, it was really a perfect opportunity and the perfect time, I think, for me to Uh, make that career change and start something new. Airlines have faced a pilot shortage for several years. Regional airlines have been hit the hardest. Regional airlines, the airlines that operate the 50 to 76 seat aircraft that go mostly to smaller communities, have been losing their pilots to the larger airlines and struggling to hire new pilots to replace the pilots they've lost. And as a result, We have seen hundreds of communities in the U.S. lose some or all of their airline service. Some U.S. airlines have started their own training programs. Others have partnered with flight schools. The pilot shortage is being experienced within the regional airline environment. Um, As soon as those pilots are getting hired by the regional airlines, they're spending minimal time there before going off to the the legacy carriers. And so what we're doing is trying to train our students, get them to 1,500 hours in the safest, most efficient way. Southwest Airlines has more than 700 planes, but parks 40 to 45 of them daily. That's because it lacks pilots to fly them. So the shortage amounts to a loss of more than 200 flights a day. So while I think we are through the worst of the pilot shortage crunch, we are nowhere near the end of it. Southwest hopes to hire around 2,200 pilots this year. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Take a look at what a tornado did in Louisiana Wednesday night. The twister damaged almost every home in a square mile radius of Tangipahoa Parish. That damage varied widely from nearly complete destruction to minor damage. The big problem is that almost every house had at least some sort of roof damage and it rained heavily for five hours after the tornado. The situation quickly made water the biggest threat to homes in the area. Authorities say many homes saw their attics flood. The water then ran down walls and damaged other parts of the homes. Flooding could end up causing more property loss than the wind did. There have been no deaths reported due to the storm and just a few minor injuries. And up next, the fifth day into the earthquake, Turkey's president says their response wasn't quick enough. And in neighboring Syria, the country's leader paid his first visit to the affected areas. And the hope of finding more survivors between the rubble and collapsed buildings, efforts are continuing to save lives. We'll have the details soon when we return. We're entering an unprecedented period of economic turmoil. The economy is unstable. Our government is in shambles and the global war on energy has created a domestic crisis. Americans need a way to protect their financial future. One way to ensure your wealth in retirement is by purchasing physical gold and silver. We can help. You can roll any part of your retirement account into a gold or silver IRA. Better yet, you can open a gold or silver IRA in five minutes or less using our online application. Preserving your family's financial legacy is a choice that's always available to you. And when you're ready, we're here to help. Call us and speak to one of our IRA professionals. 
Let's build your financial legacy together. GSI Exchange, wealth for generations to come. Welcome back. More than 21,000 people are dead five days after two devastating earthquakes shook southern Turkey and neighboring Syria. The Turkish president said the country's response wasn't fast enough. Despite the fact that we have gathered perhaps one of the largest search and rescue teams to the region with more than 141,000 members, unfortunately it is a fact that we have not been able to respond as fast as we hope. Erdogan said some people are looting markets and attacking businesses. A state of emergency has been declared in the affected areas. This would allow the state to impose necessary penalties. In Turkey, the death toll is approaching 19,000. The disaster now ranks as the seventh deadliest natural disaster of the century, surpassing Japan's 2011 earthquake and tsunami. On the other side of the border, the Syrian president made his first trip to areas impacted by the quake. He denounced the West's reaction to the calamity. They say that the West gave the priority to politics over the humanitarian situation, but this is not true. To give priority to something over another, both situations must exist. As such, the political situation exists, but the humanitarian is non-existent for the West. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said it was normal to politicize the situation. Ahead of his first speech since the earthquake, the president and his wife went to a hospital in the affected area. The presidential palace shared pictures of the couple visiting people injured in the disaster. Emergency crews made a series of dramatic rescues in Turkey today. Despite fears that it may be too late, hopes are high that more will be found. Here's Entities Cost Temenes. The search for survivors goes on in Turkey and Syria. It's been four days since the tragic earthquake that's claimed over 20,000 lives. Dramatic footage provided by the White Helmets shows volunteers rescuing two young girls from a collapsed structure in Jandaris. Rescuers broke into cheers after saving a child from the rubble in the Turkish city of Karamanaras. On Wednesday, the Israeli army rescue team pulled a two-year-old baby out alive from under the rubble in the same city. Video shows rescuers pulling a 12-year-old boy from debris and carrying him before putting him on a stretcher. The rescue of survivors lifted the spirits of weary search crews as hopes were fading that more would be found alive. A little boy smiled as rescuers pulled him out from the rubble of a collapsed building along with other members of his family. Rescue efforts continue despite the 72-hour rule. Israeli rescue and medical teams say they've rescued 10 civilians in Turkey. This video shows a rescuer in tears after a girl was pulled from a collapsed building. In Azmarin, a village near the Syrian city of Idlib, volunteers rescued a young child. A visibly scared dog was saved in Turkey's Ishkenderun. The number of those injured in both countries now stands at more than 60,000. Authorities say more than 6,000 buildings have collapsed in Turkey. Countless more were damaged. The quake zone is home to more than 10 million people. The number of those who've perished has now exceeded the death toll of Turkey's 1999 earthquake, which killed around 18,000 people. Kostem NS, NTD News. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And coming up, AI technologies that can write essays. They are causing concerns among educators around the globe. Will schools ban students from using them? And France looks to fight conspiracy theories, but one publisher tells us the French government is creating a new crime of having the wrong opinions. More shortly here on NTD News Today.
Both the U.S. and the U.K. have sanctioned seven people in the latest attempt to crack down on cyber criminal groups. The U.S. Treasury Department says six Russians and one Ukrainian are linked to an infamous Russia-based cybercrime gang that has infected millions of computers worldwide. Some of the targets include American hospitals. For years, the gang known as TrickBot has used malicious code to deploy ransomware that locks computers until the hackers are paid off. The sanctioned individuals are accused of developing hacking tools for the group or of having other prominent roles like laundering money. The U.S. Treasury says the criminal gang is associated with the Russian intelligence service. The first shipment of the U.S. Bradley fighting vehicles arrived in Germany early today. It left South Carolina last week with more than 60 Bradley vehicles destined for Ukraine. Apart from the Bradleys, armored recovery vehicles, air defense rocket launchers, and pickups also rolled off the transport ship. The U.S. announced the plan on January 9th to bolster Kyiv's fight against Russia's invasion by sending Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. Germany has also committed to sending its own armored vehicles, and France has made a similar move as well. The United States, Germany, and other NATO allies have also agreed to send battle tanks to Ukraine. Two Canadian Leopard 2s were the first Western-built battle tanks to arrive in Ukraine this past Sunday. But U.S. aid could be coming to an end. Representative Matt Gaetz filed a resolution today to end all U.S. aid to Ukraine. The resolution also seeks a peace settlement between the combatant nations. The Ukraine Fatigue Resolution is co-sponsored by 10 House members. It cites the amount and levels of U.S. support. It also adds that the U.S. is the top contributor of military aid to Ukraine. Gates says bandits in the Sinaloa Mountains hurt more Americans than the men in Crimea. Gates also criticized the idea of foreigners coming to Washington to lecture the U.S. about spending money on a conflict thousands of miles away. But even if the resolution garnered enough support in Congress, the White House hasn't given any indication it would back off the level of support for Ukraine. Spain's plans to send weapons to Ukraine is facing an obstacle. Switzerland won't allow Spain to export Swiss-made anti-aircraft guns to Ukraine. The Spanish government made the request in January. Previously, Switzerland had vetoed similar requests from Denmark and Germany. The two countries sought to ship Swiss-made armored vehicles and ammunition to Ukraine for the ongoing war. Under the Swiss War Materials Act, the exports of war materials is prohibited if the destination country is involved in an armed conflict. But in neutral Switzerland, the issue of weapons deployment is becoming more sensitive. More voices are calling for the removal of current restrictions. SpaceX is trying to stop Ukraine's military from using its Starlink satellite internet service to control drones. Company CEO Gwen Shotwell says the system was never meant to be weaponized. She says Ukraine has used it in ways that were not intended and not part of any agreement. Shotwell said the system was purely intended for humanitarian purposes, not offensive operations. SpaceX has now taken action to stop Ukraine from using Starlink with drones, but wouldn't give details. It wouldn't say whether some service outages in Ukraine were connected to the measures. The system has provided Ukraine's military with broadband connections for its operations. Starlink has shipped thousands of terminals to the country, allowing users to communicate via its network of satellites. Russia has attempted to jam Starlink signals in the region, but the company says it's been able to counter that with software changes. Elsewhere in Europe, Finland is on track to join NATO. Parliamentary groups say they may ratify NATO's founding treaties in the coming weeks. It's a key step, meaning the country could join the alliance ahead of its neighbor Sweden. The two Nordic countries sought NATO membership shortly after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and have said they want to join hand in hand. But while most NATO member states have approved the applications, Turkey objects to Sweden's candidacy. Now Finland could be taking the next step without Sweden. But Sweden is Finland's closest defensive ally. Finland shares an 800-mile border with Russia. In a case of a conflict, NATO would need Swedish territory to help Finland defend itself. But Turkey wants to see Sweden take a tougher line against the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which it considered a terror group. It also blames the group for a coup attempt. 
Speaking of border security, EU President Ursula von der Leyen said today the union has a consensus. EU leaders agreed to tighten their borders to keep away unwanted immigrants. Illegal immigration has been a highly sensitive topic in the EU since 2015. A massive wave of over a million people flooded the continent at that time. Some were fleeing the war in Syria, others left Africa in search of greener pastures. Member states fought bitterly over how to provide for them. The EU imposed mandatory refugee quotas, but Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic rejected the quotas. Unable to agree, the bloc of 450 million people has turned to tightening its borders. I think uh, it is very important that the European Council has clearly recognized that migration is a European challenge that requires a European response. Borders must be managed. We will act to strengthen our external borders and prevent irregular migration. Von der Leyen outlined concrete border plans, including watchtowers and electronic surveillance. She also mentioned that deportations made in one member state will be valid in all member states. In related news, passport stamps could be on the way out for EU visitors. A new automated entry system and exit system is set to launch in November. It will register travelers digitally. An artificial intelligence chatbot called ChatGPT is causing headaches for universities around the world. It's a powerful technology that can write essays, and it could potentially change education forever. ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence tool launched by OpenAI as a prototype in November 2022. It's available to the public and can generate answers that are nearly impossible to distinguish from human-written text and that has many educators worried. Students could potentially use the tool to answer take-home test questions and other assignments. Sciences Po Paris, one of France's most prestigious universities, prohibited the use of ChatGPT and all other AI-based tools. It means that students are not allowed to use ChatGPT to get a grade. That's it. And if they use this artificial intelligence, they break the contract of intellectual honesty because the work is no longer personal work or sourced work. So once the situation is clear, we'll have to get used to it because we'll be living with chat GPT 3, 4, 5, 6. It is likely that changes will come about very quickly and teachers will take over, probably changing the way they teach and assess students' work. OpenAI launched a prototype AI detector in January, but the tool isn't fully reliable and can only detect 26% of AI written texts for now. I think we still need humanity in writing, but maybe we don't need as many humans to to get that humanity. So um, I think these programs will be sort of writing first drafts of documents, but you'll still need oversight, human oversight to, to check it hasn't made any mistakes and to correct for biases that the programs will have. So. Part of the training of students then is to try and understand how to use these tools effectively and ethically. Other educators are more open with the new technology. At Middlesex University in London, Professor Balbir Barn has recently published a blog arguing ChatGPT could be your ally. He says he thinks it's a mistake to outlaw the tool and he's looking at how it can improve the student educator experience. These technologies are enabling technologies. We have seen how there's been this evolution from word spell, you know, spelling checks on word and then grammar checks on word and then summarizers. They're all part of the writing armory. What we're now seeing is some generative writing capability. What we need to do is to equip the students with the recognition that that's just a starting position. We can now use what's been produced, enhance it, and critically evaluate it and identify its weaknesses and then produce a piece of work. By the time schools opened for the new year, New York City, Los Angeles, and other big public school districts in the U.S. began to block ChatGPT in classrooms and on school devices. The Church of England's governing body has voted in favor of offering blessings to same-sex couples. The church's general synod, which is made up of hundreds of elected members, backed the proposals by a wide margin after an eight-hour debate. 
The motion includes an acknowledgement of a failure to welcome LGBT people to the church. The move could put pressure on people who hold more traditional views. Reverend Bernard Randall was dismissed from his job for a sermon he gave expressing conservative Christian beliefs on marriage. Here's how he reacts to the vote. As someone who holds to the the old-fashioned or traditional or whatever you want to might call it the old views if the church starts saying well actually we're changing we're shifting the pressure on people like me clergy members of congregations who want to say no no we still hold the view that the church has held for 2000 years they will be under a lot of pressure from society whereas previously people could say well this is just what the church teaches and we welcome everybody but there are standards that we like to uh, encourage but now if you can't even say well the church teaches this it's very very difficult to explain to people it becomes a personal opinion rather than the church's teaching the motion doesn't include a same-sex marriage right but it means same-sex couples can go to anglican churches for services including prayers of dedication thanksgiving and blessing the Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, who led the debate, said, quote, I know that what we have proposed as a way forward does not go nearly far enough for many, but too far for others. Last month, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, said he joyfully welcomed the proposals. The decision for clergy to offer the blessings is voluntary. The European Union says so-called conspiracy theories have been on the rise since the beginning of the pandemic. And in France, those who are considered to follow conspiracy theories might soon have to make their case in front of a judge. The French government is reportedly preparing new bills to prevent conspiracy believers from spreading their ideas, notably on COVID vaccines. And today's France correspondent David Vives has more. If you believe the world is divided between good and bad, or if you enjoy reading articles that don't provide answers but raise questions, then maybe you believe in conspiracy theories. That's according to EU guidelines on identifying conspiracy theories. The guide states that since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, misinformation and conspiracy theories have flourished globally, without quoting specific examples. It also provides advice on how to deal with someone who believes in conspiracy theories. In France, the Interior Ministry will hold a conference this spring to find new legal measures to combat what it called the scourge of conspiracy theories. This followed a report by the government's cult monitoring agency. Publisher Eric Verag says the French government is about to create a new crime of having the wrong opinions. Even if they do not yet put it like that, we can see that public prosecutors and certain judges are beginning to accept that a conspiracy theory is a form of crime. And I think that sooner or later, in the weeks to come, not in the months, in the weeks to come, There will be an attempt to introduce bills, little by little, building this notion of the crime of conspiracy by saying, we no longer have the right to disinform on social networks, and so on. I think a repressive logic is at work. Virag says suspended health workers who had refused the COVID jab are one group who might be tarnished in the future as believing in conspiracy theories. Half a year after the government ended the COVID state of emergency, suspended healthcare workers are still barred from work in France. The health ministry has said they should remain suspended because their refusal was not ethical. Eric Virag says accusing people to believe in conspiracy theories can justify to take drastic measures against Dans them. La stratégie de, de réponse. This is part of the strategy of how to respond to people who resist. They are being called mentally ill. That's to say, we are not going to say to people, you are against the government. And that's why we'll put you in jail. The government tries to tell them, you are extreme right-wing terrorists. And if we can't say you are Nazis, we'll say you are a member of a sect. And in reality, you are crazy. That's it. Or to protect you from yourself, it's better that we remove you from society and that we make you follow courses of re-education. Exactly like in China, like in communist countries, like in North Korea. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, what makes great football players? Ahead of this weekend's big game, we hear the stories behind the success of two quarterbacks. 
And the Puppy Bowl returns for its 19th year, entertaining sports fans and animal lovers alike on Super Bowl Sunday. Details to come on NTD News Today. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYoon.com. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Good to have you back with us. Two quarterbacks facing off this weekend at the Super Bowl, but it's two men who will be off the field that have made a huge impact on this game. I'm not the man I am um, on the field, off the field. Um, the quarterback I am, the leader I am. Um, I'm none of that without him. My dad, means, he means the world to me, man. I mean, he's he set an example for me of how you have to go through this business. Patrick Mahomes' dad had an 11-year Major League Baseball career and taught his son how to be a pro and how to persevere through adversity. He dealt with a lot of positives and he was in the, in the MLB at an early age, but he also battled in, in the minor leagues for a long time and he just followed, kept following his dream and following his dream and he was able to make it to a World Series and it showed me that no matter if it's not you're not having success at that moment, if you continue to follow your dreams, you'll, you'll make it. I just try to make sure that he knows that, you know, in his corner, I'm going to be there and as long as he goes out there and, and does the best he can, he, he'll never hear a gripe from me. Hertz's dad was his high school football coach, and Jalen's been learning about leadership from him since the days he was just a ball boy for his dad's teams. It's a blessing to watch a young man that, you know, d developed a passion for a sport and really, really worked hard at every level and every turn. What does dad mean to you? For like, I'm a direct reflection of him and a spitting image of him in so many ways, and I, I love him and I respect, from, I respect him for um, how tough he was on me, um, how honest he was with me, and the man he raised. The love and support these Super Bowl star quarterbacks receive from their dads is shaping them into great leaders in their own right, not just for their teams. Mahomes is now a dad, father of two, leading, guiding, and while Hurts isn't a dad, he's well aware of the influence he can have on the next generation. You don't really realize the impact you're doing until you reflect on it. And I think to have these opportunities and, and be able to represent so many different people is something I definitely have in my heart when I'm out there playing. You know, I definitely never forget where I come from. And most importantly, I know that there are kids out there watching. There's always kids out there watching. As the Super Bowl nears, players are preparing to give it their best, but they're not the only ones who need to be ready. Football injuries are common, so the NFL's medical team is on standby to deal with sudden illness and injuries. Entity's Kost Temenes tells us more about the medical response team's toolkit. This Sunday Super Bowl game in Glendale, Arizona will feature the battle between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. But despite being the highlight of many players' careers, for NFL medical officials, it's just like every other game. We prepare for it and plan for it just like we do every single game. And, and really, every week and every game is our Super Bowl. By that, I mean we have to be prepared for a catastrophic event or illness. And if that occurs, we have to function at the highest level. The medical team has put in place a number of measures on and off the field. The blue tent is the sideline concussion examination space. Uh, this tent is mandatory for all of our sideline concussion evaluations. Sometimes it's used for other evaluations, like they might come in here to do an orthopedic exam or some other exam. Concussions jumped by nearly 20% during the 2022 regular season. 
A concussion suffered by a Miami Dolphins quarterback last year prompted the NFL and Players Union to adopt enhanced concussion protocols. Alongside the concussion tent, the medical team has access to a sideline video replay system. It helps demonstrate injuries to the sideline medical staff of both teams. In addition, there's also a spotter booth. Um, we have 69 field-facing camera views that we have to choose from. Now, we don't look through all six, 69 during a game, but there's usually four or five views that are going to give us the best view and, and best angle to see certain things. Referees can be notified by a medical timeout button should any players display injury behavior. Off the field, a room is on reserve for what's called the 60-minute meeting. In the pre-game meeting, medical officials and independent medical personnel gather to discuss players' health and identify each person's role in an emergency, allowing for better overall coordination and communication. Cost MNS, NTD News. Before the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles face off for this year's Super Bowl trophy, Puppy Bowl 2023 will first bring joy to dog lovers. The 19th Puppy Bowl is just around the corner with more than 100 furry players ready to romp around the football field. Referee Dan Schnackner explains some of the new highlights of the coming broadcast. Our puppy players, well-deserved, are gonna pull up in the team bus, parked here in the barking lot, get off the bus, roll down the red carpet, plenty of room for the paparazzi to take their pictures, go into the tunnel. That's gonna take them right to, of course, the main stage, the field where everything happens. This year, the network is partnering up with more than 60 shelters from 34 states. This is not only to entertain viewers with cuteness, but also to raise awareness about pet adoption. The program draws inspiration from the Human Super Bowl and features fun renaming of some of the animals. Uh, they've got Tom Brady, we've got Tom Barkey, uh, they've got Jalen Hurts, we've got Taylor Hurts, and of course they have Josh Allen, we have Josh Allen Hounds. Some puppies have special needs, like missing legs or hearing impairments, but the referee says they play as well as all other dogs. The game will air on Super Bowl Sunday on Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, TBS, and more starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. February 12th. The furriest rivalry in sports is back. When Team Rough battles Team Fluff in Puppy Bowl 19, the Big Blue Crew versus the Tangerine Machine. Touchdown! Who will sniff Puppy Bowl glory? But that's uh, illegal and win the coveted Lump Barky Trophy. <laughs> Find out when Puppy Bowl 19 kicks off, Sunday, February 12th on Animal Planet. Some non-traditional sporting items are hitting the auction block this month in New York. Heritage Auctions is presenting a preview of its rare lots. A total of 1,400 lots will be on auction at the auction featuring baseball hats, various sports jerseys, championship rings, and more. Among the many highlights, the most eye-catching and valuable is a 1916 Babe Ruth rookie card. It's been kept in near perfect condition. The card is from Ruth's rookie season with the Boston Red Sox. That was long before the charismatic slugger was traded to the New York Yankees and his legendary career took off. The item is estimated at upwards of $3 million. Uh, it's one of the most unique cards in the world. It shows Babe Ruth with the Boston Red Sox as a pitcher early on in his career, obviously. But the condition of this card is just incredible. Sharp corners, well-centered, and we're expecting that to sell for several million. Babe Ruth died in 1948. His team was one of the first at the time to have tributes printed on their uniforms for the great baseball player. A gray Yankees jersey from that time will also appear in the auction. It belonged to then center fielder Joe DiMaggio. He was said to be one of the first athletes to cross over into the mainstream in Hollywood through ties with Marilyn Monroe. So for a month and a half that season, the Yankees put on the black armband in remembrance of Babe Ruth. It was actually one of the first times the Yankees ever did that, the third time in their history. Um, and so this is a great piece because it kind of combines two Yankee greats, Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio, together in one piece. This jersey has the word New York on its chest. It was a Yankees road jersey that DiMaggio wore to a game in 1948, the only jersey from that season. The price is expected to bring in more than $800,000. All other lots in the auction come from more contemporary players. The auction will take place February 25th to 26th on Heritage Auctions' website. 
Over in Peru, it's been an unusual week for extreme athlete and adventurer Savas Caban. He lived out a, li- a long-held dream, crossing Peru with one ultramarathon per day for 86 consecutive days. If you want something so bad, nothing can stop you. So no matter how, how much pain I had, some days I had like uh, pain the whole day. My feet were bleeding, but uh, it didn't stop me. So because, like, like I said, this is my dream. This is my passion. And uh, for me, it was like, yeah, I had to do it. It was not just for fun. It, I had to do it. So nothing could stop me. Cities, deserts, beaches, rainforests, and snow-capped mountains. For three months, Caban traveled more than 3,000 miles through the different landscapes and climate systems of Peru. The highest altitude he climbed was over 16,000 feet. The distance he covered each day averaged 37 miles. Finally, this Tuesday, Caban arrived at the finish line in Lima, the capital of Peru. The German athlete set out from the same city last November. His route then stretched along the Chilean border to the inland mountains of Peru. Some of the famous sites he ran through included the Nazca Lines, the Peruvian rainforest, and some of the highest parts of the Andes. Coban described the experience as a daily struggle that tested his physical and mental limits. But he persevered with infinite patience and motivation. That's all for today's program. We're really glad to have you with us. Please send us an email if you'd like to tell us something. We're going to put it on screen. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.